Here we go. Um, my project is called Symbols of Borges. Um, and so how many people, just by show of hands, have not heard of Borges? One, two, okay, great, excellent. Okay, well, we met one objective already, uh, which is bring Borges to a new audience and carry on his, his, <laughs> his thought. No, but really, like, when I, when I started, okay, so the project uh, in Professor Berinsky's class is where, is, is where it sort of hatched, you know? It's like, uh, we started reading Borges, uh, a series of his, of his fictions, and, and they really moved me, and I was just getting involved in philosophy, and so I decided to uh, focus on, on, this, on this author and um, try to, to um, work on his thought in a philosophical sense and also in a uh, linguistic sense. So uh, this, is, this is where the project went. Uh, let's do a little rundown of how this presentation will go. First, we're going to talk about the Borges bio. So we're going to, um, I'll let you know who Borges is, what his life was like, and um, then we're going to get into uh, aesthetic philosophy. So I hope everybody drank their coffee and uh, <laughs> wide-eyed, here we go. Um, it, yeah, Bo Borges subscribed to something called ultraism, which is something I don't fully understand, but uh, it has a tie into the, the symbolic sort of philosophy that I want to, that I want to talk about. So I'll talk about um, how Borges was using symbols in his philosophy of ultraism. Uh, so this, this project basically begs, in philosophy we have something called begging the question, which is like you make a statement and then everybody goes, okay, so what? You know, so anyway, this, this project is begging two questions. One is who is Borges and the other is what is a symbol, right? So um, after we run through the bio, we'll get into uh, what a symbol is and how Borges uh, constructs symbols in his, in, his, in his writing. And that has to do with, with two things, dimension uh, and perception. And that's going to, I'm, I'm going to address how the mind comprehends uh, symbols. And then the second half of the presentation is going to be uh, just talking about my Keystone project itself and the translation that I did of one of Borges' stories and the script that I wrote. So here we go. This is Jorge Luis Borges. This is a photo from 1921. So he was 22 in this photo. I'm 22 now, all right. <laughs> He's born in Buenos Aires, um, but, but traveled a lot with his family. His dad was, I, I think he was a professor of, of literature. So from a really early age, Borges was involved in um, r reading and writing and, and was uh, very literary even in his childhood. Uh, the Sur magazine was an, was an Argentinian magazine from the, uh, the uh, first half of the 1900s. I think it's, it might still be in, in print today. I'm not sure, though. Um, so one interesting event that I think ties into to, um, thinking philosophically is, is suffering head wounds. Yeah, I had a couple of con concussions in, in high school, and it was interesting for me to read that Borges also suffered a really serious head wound and uh, then started writing these fantastic stories, which are... Um, really metaphorical and symbolic in their nature. And possibly related to the wound, possibly not, he went through progressive blindness, which he said is nothing to worry about. It's like a beautiful sunset. And, uh, <laughs> and he was supported throughout his life by a circle of friends. And these are some of those friends. On the left is the author Adolfo Bioy Casares, who is another Argentinian and a friend of Borges. And they would also uh, write together under a, a pen name, H. Bustos Domecq, and I haven't read any of their works, but, but uh, they were uh, ironic and, and, and parody on, on the literature of the day. And then the, the, the figure in the middle is Victoria Ocampo, who, who started the, uh, the Sewer magazine in which Borges was publishing. Okay. So one aspect of Borges' writing is that there's more than meets the eye. This is, this is what I sort of want to get into in talking about symbolic representation, is that the idea of dimension plays in. Okay, so if you look at the square in the middle and you imagine it as the same object as the line above, that's possible, right? You can imagine that. It recedes maybe backwards or hides behind. Okay, so anyway. Um, what's interesting is that in each dimension there are certain properties that um, can, be, can be projected through into a, into a lower dimension actually. So, 
Can you imagine that the cube and the square are the same object as well? OK. But uh, there's one property of the cube that isn't contained in the square, namely that you can't write inside the square, but you can write inside the cube. Can you imagine that the word 3D is written inside the cube? OK. That's kind of funny, isn't it? Because it can also be outside the cube. Anyway, um, the idea now is that in a word, there's sort of similar information packed in about, about its properties and, quote unquote, the dimension that it's, that it's living in. Okay? Um, so the, the question is, what, what, what dimension does a story live in? Right? And I think my answer is the fourth dimension. Whoa. <laughs> no, the idea is that the time in the story is flowing, and you need to keep a, a constant grasp on that flow, or your symbols begin to lose their meaning, right? The representation is no longer, um, it's no longer continuous. It doesn't flow. Um, so this is kind of interesting. We had a, a 3D shape. Now, does it appear that the 3D shapes are overlapping? It does, right? However, you can also imagine that they're not overlapping because you can pick, imagine that this is the bottom of this cube. And you see that the bottoms don't actually overlap. So you can move the shape through what I'm calling 4D and, and imagine that it's actually just a 3D shape, which is being uh, projected. So and this idea of, of, of objects living possibly in a, in a higher dimension is what I'm calling a metaphor, right? So what Borges has is got, is got his words, and they have, they have these, um, these properties, and as they are projected, uh, they become metaphors. So every time you, you revisit an image in a story, it carries the same sort of weight and significance as a metaphor. So if a story is going on in 4D, um, one argument that I'm making in my, in my essay about, about um, symbols is that Borges had to keep track of a fifth dimension, actually, because he had different characters in his stories which live together but have different frames of mind, right? And there are different um, characters which meet, conflict, and um, in order to keep the continuous flow of time, Borges had to keep an idea about the timeline for each individual character and then synthesize it. And then synthesize it down again to put it into, into a form that we can actually read, you know, a line of text. So he has all of these, these metaphorical images, these symbols in his stories that are played out through, through this sort of, I don't know how to, what verb to use, but it's like he has all this information and it gets packed in, you know, packed and packed and packed in. So if the idea of symbols are still confusing to you, I thought that it would be helpful to use an example from visual art because there wasn't a movement in visual art called symbolism. So this is a symbolist painting. And what we see is a, a subject surrounded by some objects that give insight into the symbol of the work. Okay? This is a painting by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. It was, the date is 1864 to 1870. And this is a representation of his spouse named Elizabeth Sedal portrayed as Dante's Beatrice. Okay? That was from Wikipedia. I did not analyze that myself. But what, what's going on is that she's, <laughs> she's surrounded by a lot of objects, right? Check these out. Check out the sundial, right? Pointing on noon. Perhaps her time has come, right? Here's the red bird, and it's wearing a halo, which gives us insight that it's not an earthly form, but a heavenly form. And it's carrying over her hands a white poppy flower. Now, Elizabeth Sedal committed suicide on laudanum overdose, which comes from the poppy flower. So I believe what, what, uh, Rossetti, is trying to, what Rossetti is trying to convey is her innocent death and his, his grief for that innocent death, you know, because the bird has come and uh, dropped the flower into her hands, and she's moved on into another, into another realm. Okay. So those are how symbols represent a metaphor. Okay. Yes, Nikki. Five minutes. Oh, 
Five minutes, here we go. Let's talk about the story, Death in the Compass. So this is Borges' story, and this is what I'm really, really, uh, this, this is what I focused on in my project. This is the script that I've written, came from this text. So I've got a joke because I can't tell you the story, I don't want to give it away, but I summed it up in a joke. <laughs> what did the detective say when everything clicked into place, but he realized he couldn't prevent the crime? Shoot. <laughs> so, now I'm going to talk about the symbols in the story, okay? Um, Borges packs symbols into everything. He packs symbols into his settings, he packs symbols into the character, into the characters that he uses, and, and the story itself carries symbolic value. So, in terms of settings, there's one that I want to highlight, which is, it's really, um, I think, powerful, a powerful image, powerful metaphor to convey a symbol. Um, the detective is walking to the scene of the crime, and Borges, the last crime, the ultimate crime, Borges mentions that it is one of those dusks that seem to be dawns. Now, at the face of this, it seems, okay, everybody can sort of imagine, you know, the kind of hazy light. However, what's being conveyed is that night is coming, whereas day was expected, right? One of those dusks that seem to be dawn. So what seems like a light and, and um, progressive move for this detective, he's going to solve the crime, is actually something much sinister, which is hidden under the surface, and you don't dig that out until you get to the end of the story. In terms of characters, oh, the other one setting, uh, setting symbol that's really important in this story is the idea of the rhombus, the, 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 the four-sided shape resurfaces again and again. And uh, it's, it's, it's critical when Detective Lonrot makes the insight that the crime isn't three-sided, it's four-sided. Um, in terms of characters, Borges had a great, a great tradition of cross-referencing his stories. So what he does right in the introduction is compare his main character, Lonrot, to Auguste Dupin, who is a famous detective from uh, Poe. And Poe was basically the the father of the, the detective fiction story. However, Poe's stories were really gruesome and graphic and violent. So uh, I think the idea behind that symbol in comparing Lonrot to Dupin is that uh, it's, it's, it's turned on his head because at the end of the story, Lonrot is killed. Sorry, spoiler alert. However, um, the, uh, the, 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 the irony is that Dupin would have foreseen what Lonrot didn't. However, Lonrot is surrounded by a Poe-like sort of gruesome tale, and he, and he is uh, unable to, to follow through and, and, and finish uh, the, the, the solving of the crime. However, his, his, there's one symbol uh, in his opposite character, which is really straightforward and interesting, and I think um, it's very important, actually. The, the, the villain in this story is named Red Scarlock. And Scarlock is a German word meaning red. It's a reduplication, red, red. Now I think I think Scarlock is personification of anger, and and violence, and I think it's a personal vendetta that he has against Lonrot, and he follows through and he murders Lonrot because of this sort of personal vendetta. Um, however, that feeling is symbolized by his name itself. Now, the symbols of the story are that uh, death and the compass. Right, death is a symbol meaning that uh, life. <coughs> is finite, we are not immortal, we are going to um, come to an end of everything we know. So uh, in the time that we have, we need to find a moral compass, right, that allows a direction to our actions and drives um, our desires and our will. And so Lonrot's compass, however, he thought it was pointing at true magnetic north, as it turns out, his compass was set by um, another character in the story, namely Scarlock. Scarlock was directing Lonrot to each and uh, every um, crime scene. And as Lonrot would solve the crime, all that really was happening was a next step in Scarlock's plan to uh, end him. So, in conclusion, the script I've written. Uh, it takes the symbols from the story, rephrases them into action, and presents that action 
for a new audience which hasn't experienced Borges before, but now has an insight to how symbolic and um, powerful his writing is on an emotional level. And I know I was affected by it. I hope that uh, when you all see the play, if it ever comes out, I have only got the script written now, but we hope that uh, maybe a junior will pick it up and run with it. I hope that maybe a junior will pick it up and run with it, and we'll all uh, enjoy it. Thanks very much. <laughs>